I'm Liz, the Chief Mom Officer, and when I'm not busy being the breadwinner of my family of five, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's Mom's Basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Duggan. Let's study some billionaire investors today, shall we? Can we invest like the best? And do they have anything else to teach us besides making money? Today, we welcome William Green to break it all down for us. He's the author of Richer, Wiser, Happier, How the Greatest Win in Market and Life. Plus, over a billion dollars is sitting at the IRS waiting for you to claim it. And you need to do it soon. That's better than finding a $20 bill in your pocket. We'll discuss this and more during our headline segment. Later, we'll toss out the Haven Lifeline to James, who is looking to break into financial planning. Do Joe and OG have any tips for him? And I'll share some of my stellar trivia with you. And now, two guys who have whatever is the opposite of the billionaire touch. It's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-J-J. You know what they call that? They call that the trillionaire touch. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Stacky Benjamins podcast. I'm Joe Saul, CI, Average Joe Money on Twitter and the other trillionaire when it comes to podcasting success. Cross the table from me, Mr. OG. Or like a dollar air. Dollar air. Yeah. Hey, oh, who can have a one figure salary on this job? Exactly. <laughs> We're at nine bucks been nine years nine bucks bam those are some pretty impressive pay raises though you know to go from like to, to next year when we go from nine to ten I mean, that's a solid 11 percent pay raise that is a, that that's amazing yes oh my goodness we got a great show today we got william green here william green is going to be talking to us about richer wiser happier and uh he has like mr jack schwager a big show back in november we had jack schwager on talking about uh some great investors. We're going to talk about great investment habits with William Green. Remarkable gentleman. We got some great headlines too. Some big news happened last week at the last minute. So we're packing that in here. But first, as you know, small businesses are still recovering from 2020 and looking for resources to rise to the challenge. And that's why Dell Technologies assembled an all-star lineup of podcasters to create a virtual conference to share advice and inspiration for small businesses. Whether you're still working remotely or back together again, let Dell Technologies help safeguard your business with modern devices and Windows 10 Pro. Search Dell Technologies Small Business Podference on radio.com, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts starting May 10th. All right. We've got a little, you know how they call it a baker's dozen OG when they give you that 13th donut? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's called heaven. Yes. We're, we're, we're doing a Baker's two headlines, meaning we're going to pack in a third, but don't tell anybody. So let's move. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. First headline comes to us from Kiplinger, and this is written by Rocky Mangle. Rocky, by the way, looking at some moolah that you and I might have waiting for you. It, it, do you like it when you find like a $20 bill in your pocket that you didn't know was there? Okay, I asked you that question, but I know you long enough to know there is no way you didn't know the twenty dollar bill was there. Like you've always known the twenty dollar bill's there. I've had it happen on occasion. Have you really? Yeah. Or like, hey, yeah. hey oh, how long did it take for it to disappear? Because for me it's like fourteen minutes. <laughs> yeah, you you're not a fan of having cash in your wallet. I I'm not a fan of spending the cash in my wallet. Oh that's that's my problem. Like well, if it's you, in there, I'm like, ah, I don't want to use this. You're more like the average person they talk about that you should have cash in your wallet because people are afraid to spend it, but they'll spend the plastic. I'm exactly the opposite. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I have credit cards too, so, you know. Yeah, but you'll bring, you'll bring those babies out. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> nope, no problem. Yeah. Well, listen, we can help you get more money, OG, and uh, both of our stackers get more money too. Is there an unclaimed tax refund waiting for you, Rocky writes? The IRS is looking for 1.3 million people who didn't file a 2017 tax return. 1.3 million people didn't file one. 
1.31 million people didn't file on. <laughs> That's going to end well for those people. I'll tell you as a guy that uh, way back in the day did not file a tax return and then decided that uh, not doing anything would be a great idea. I can tell you how that goes. It doesn't go well. But they do track you down eventually, that, especially if you owe them money. It is. It's a shocker how they find you. Yeah. But of those people, they may be owed a refund of taxes withheld or otherwise prepaid. In fact, there's more than $1.3 billion of potential refunds waiting to be claimed. The median potential refund, 865 bucks. Hmm. But here's the deal. If you didn't file your 2017 OG, you have until May 17th of this year to collect the money. That's it. If you don't do it by May 17th, your uncle in Washington is going to use it to erase the debt. Well, maybe that's what they want to do. You know, write a check to that's it. You're like national debt. You're, you're like, well, I got 865 waiting for me, but you know what? Uh, I'm going to put that they in the need ki- it more than me. I'm going to put that in the kitty. You know, maybe that'll get me the high speed rail I've been looking for. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and I am looking for high speed rail. Please give me high speed rail. And you know what? I'm sure it's going to stop in Texarkana, by the way. I was going to say, and and you can wave to it as it blows by your town (laughs) at 200 miles an hour. You're like, I love that I can drive three hours to get on the high-speed rail to to go back to Little Rock, (laughs) which is two hours the other way. But I can get there in 40 minutes from Dallas. So It's incredible. If you've taxed debt or didn't file other returns, the IRS could hold your 2017 return check if you didn't file a 2018 or 19, by the way. In addition, the IRS may also apply your 2017 refund to any federal or state taxes you owe. But I think that's a good thing, right? I mean, you know, get it paid. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, get it paid. Our second headline, because, man, we got a lot of headlines today. Lots of stuff happened last week. Last Wednesday, uh, Bernie Madoff passed away in prison. And, man, what a... What a... uh, That guy, all the stuff that he did, and uh, we will link to in the show notes, by the way, we interviewed Diana Enriquez from the New York Times, and she actually wrote the book that the uh, movie starring Michelle Pfeiffer and Robert De Niro as Bernie Madoff was based on. But I remember her saying that that Bernie Madoff's scam was so good, OG, that it was so good that, you know, they say if things, if something seems to not be right, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Bernie Madoff was a good enough scam artist, obviously, by the huge amount of money he scammed, that it didn't seem too good to be true. He exuded that this was a real thing. Like every, everything about his demeanor was this, this is it. And then the other problem, of course, they also say that you should get referrals to people so it's harder to be scammed, right? So if the smart people around you are working with a, a person, uh, that there's some safety in getting a referral versus just calling somebody that you don't know out of the blue. And yet Bernie Madoff worked with some of the smartest people in New York City and still took them for a bunch of money. I don't know. There's, there's a lot of lessons about being scammed. That, um, Wasn't he showing account statements that showed 12% a year growth every year? Yeah, and the fact that he could do that and it didn't raise anybody's... <laughs> exactly. They did recover most of the money, though. I don't remember the exact dollar amount. I think it's probably still going on. But it was in the 70 80% range it's, of recovery, I think. But still, the time, the time... That is good. But the time value that money, too, while it was gone... Oh, well, yeah. I mean, that doesn't make it better. No. It's not like, well, they you know, got most of it back. Yeah. It's, you know, still pretty crappy. I know you and I have a mutual friend whose mom got scammed, uh, by one of these, uh, people that, you know, call you on the phone. In fact, my, my, my mother-in-law got a call a couple of weeks ago from someone saying that her grandson was in trouble. And she said, who Nick? And of course, the second she said, Nick, the name of my son, the scammer yeah. picked up the word Nick and said, yeah, Nick, I, I, I drove, I was driving with Nick to New York and, and she goes from Seattle. And he goes, yeah, we had to drive all the way across the country. Like she was, she was feeding him the information that yeah. he was using. And so we got this call from my sister-in-law that said, Hey, Nick has a big problem. He is in New York city. They screwed something up and he's in jail. 
and he needs... And you're like, what? No, he's not. He's at work in Seattle. By the way, this is how compassionate my mother-in-law is. You know what my mother-in-law told the scammer? Hmm. Have him call his parents. I, I can't come up with that money. Nice. <laughs> it was great. She, she totally believed everything and still just said, yeah, I can't do anything about that. Sucks to be yeah. you, Nick. <laughs> I guess, guess grandma's not getting a Christmas card anymore, huh? I guess Nick knows where he falls on the uh, on the hierarchy of uh, where where he's at in the will. You can't scam can't scam grandma because she's too damn cheap. That's right. Yeah, there's a couple of great YouTube channels where they deconstruct how that works on you know those those senior scams, and they'll go through it and do it with them. ARP is also all over that and has a podcast about it. We'll link to all this stuff. And by the way, if you have our guide to these shows, which is the stacker that comes out the night before our Monday and Wednesday shows, you already have that sitting in front of you, but we'll link to it in the show notes as well. Cause yeah, a lot of, a lot of resources, but do you think there could be a, another Bernie Madoff? Will there be another one? Well, sure. I mean, maybe not to that scale. It's going, it's going on all the time. There was an article I read in investment news a couple of weeks ago about that. Uh, I think we covered it. The advisor who just disappeared with 10 million bucks and they don't have any idea where he is. He's just like in the woods somewhere. Is that the man? We covered it a long time ago, but I was reading that update last week. Yeah, like I you still were don't know where he is. about his wife saying that he needs to come out of hiding. It's time yeah. to time to pay the piper wife's in on it. She's <laughs> the cops are making her. He's like, he's living in the attic. Something like that. But wherever there's a seemingly easier way, we saw it with all of the uh, PPP loans. We see it with the woman last week who got transferred a million to into her Schwab account by accident and went, who, me? What? No, I, I didn't get that. I'm like, yeah, you did. We saw it. You're like, we see, we see the transaction history. We saw it go into your account and you took it out. What did you do with it? I didn't take it out. Okay, lady, listen, this is you on video at Bank of America withdrawing the money <laughs> to pay a cashier's check to go Not buy me. a Range Rover. What me? That Range Rover is in your driveway. We see it. Like, what the F? Like, so whenever there's an opportunity for people to, you know, cut corners and they think that's the easier way. The funny thing is, of course, is that if you did everything the right way, that's actually the easier way. And what I mean by that is this doesn't have to be so nefarious as like, and then I scammed a whole bunch of old people. It can just be like, and then I took huge risks in my, when I was in my fifties because I didn't have enough money saved. And when you get to that spot where you feel like you're past the point of no return, whether it's something really terrible, like I'm going to scam grandma or I'm going to try to steal money from Charles Schwab or, or something less, but equally as detrimental to your long-term success as like, I'm 52. I haven't done anything. So therefore I must do something crazy. I must put all my money in Bitcoin because that could be the only possible solution. I was looking online and apparently the only thing I can do is buy out of the money call options. And I got to put all my money in it because I'm so far behind the eight ball. When the easier thing would have been put a hundred bucks in a Roth starting when you're like 18, like you'd be fine. Do the easy thing longer than trying to do the hard thing. That sounds like a slogan. Do the easy thing longer. <laughs> Do the easy thing so you don't get a scam grandma. Yeah. yeah. TM. It's like a t-shirt. <laughs> Might just scam grandma later. Just put some money in your Roth instead. Our third headline comes to us from uh, MSN. And uh, uh, you saw Coinbase had their IPO last week. Direct listing, actually, but yep had their direct listing, but that still is an initial public offering, right? Yeah. It's a type of one, I suppose. Yeah. I think you can still call it an IPO, but uh, obviously there've been a lot of stories written about that already. And people talking about if you want to buy something in your portfolio that almost like you buy a mining company instead of buying gold, you know, you can buy Coinbase and you're going to get a little bit of the, uh, do you think up. that in like 10 years from now, there's going to be a story that says, if you would have bought, like they did with Tesla, right? So Tesla was like, if you bought a Tesla when it came out and it was 70 grand versus putting 70 grand in Tesla stock, 
you to put that same 70 grand in Tesla stock, you'd have 7 million. You think it'd be like, if you bought Coinbase, $50,000 of Bitcoin when it came out versus buying 50,000 of Coinbase, you think it's the, the product, the Bitcoin is going to be like, meh, but the stock of the product is going to be through the roof. I can't wait. Five years from now, we got to do that headline. You got to do the thing we did in elementary school where you take the headline, you like bury it in the backyard with a date on it. And then you pull this out and you're like, oh yeah, we got to talk about that now. Yeah. If there's only a tool for us to be able to remind, remind ourselves of things in the future. If only there were, man, that technology, somebody could invent that. They make like a to-do list. They make a bunch of money, just a bunch of money, a to-do list for the future. What? So, uh, this is the one piece of news that I haven't seen widely reported. Uh, CEO Brian Armstrong says that when they were first uh, building the crypto trading platform, which by the way, as of the time we're recording this worth $60 billion. He said in 2012, he had what he called an awesome prototype. He wrote this in the hacker news forum. He had this awesome prototype he was working on that he thought quote, has a good shot at changing the world. He said he believed credit card fees to be too high. And then the coming years, the solution would prove to be digital currency like Bitcoin or some derivative of it. (laughs) <laughs> that he charges two and a half percent per transaction on, but the credit card fees are too high. Those, yeah, are, yeah. those are way too high. Yeah. Yeah. But he said that digital currency shows some early promise, but are way too difficult to use for normal people. To me, this is an opportunity and I'm in a position to start laying the groundwork. His suggestion was dismissed. One user wrote, I'm going to call it right now. Bad idea. <laughs> yeah. A comment on his blog. Bad idea. I think this is going nowhere, dude. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So you want to create a store that like brings every product on earth to your doorstep? Horrible. How, how, how are you going to do that? Yeah. No one's going to do that. Can't do that. That that's horrible. Wait, 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 wait. So you're going to get people to drive around other people and uh, you'll just sit in an office somewhere in San Francisco and collect some money for that. Like people aren't going to, people aren't going to do that. But I love this idea, you know, for the founders out there, the conviction, OG, to stick to your guns and to, if, if there's an idea that you know is good to stick with it. And yet, where is that line, right? Where's the line when you give up versus pushing through adversity to get it done? I wish we could pick the lock on that one. Yeah, I was going to say, like, what's, what's the difference between tenacity and foolishness? <laughs> yes. It's always in the rearview mirror, that's for sure. It, yeah, absolutely. Makes me think like someday, you know, we'll have a third listener to this show. Like if we just keep pushing and pushing, it's it's going to happen. Maybe fourth. By the way, on on that note, in all seriosity, OG, to coin a new term, got to say a big thanks to everybody listening. Because you know what we did? We, we passed a milestone this last week. Oh, yeah? 28 million downloads of this show. That is, that's, that's mom pressing play a lot. It's a lot of devices she had to buy. She had to buy a ton. 28, we owe people 28 million thank yous. That is absolutely fantastic. And if we had 28 million, if we had a dollar for every download, how great, how great would that be? We would have never made it past, I don't know what, 10 million. You know what we do? (laughs) We, we would have never. By a jet, <laughs> just slightly over ten million. Uh, I wish if we had the twenty-eight million dollars, you know what I'd do with it? I'd take it to Navy Federal Credit Union because at Navy Federal they don't just serve the Navy; they also serve the Army, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, Coast Guard, and even the Space Force. No matter where you're at in your military career, they offer the products and resources to help you navigate your finances, like. If you pay your credit cards off, stackers, like you should every month, they have the Navy Federal More Rewards American Express card. It offers three times points at supermarkets, food delivery, and gas, plus one point on everything else. I'm not sure of the ROI on food delivery. By the way, you guys do food delivery very much, OG? Like DoorDash or like Instacart? Yeah, DoorDash. Uh, yeah, yeah. I kind of get the Instacart thing. Like I, I get time is money. So having somebody do your grocery shopping for you makes sense to me. I just look at that DoorDash fee and I think, oh, it's ridiculous. Yeah. I think, I think, I don't know. But anyway, three times points at supermarkets, food delivery and gas, one point and everything else. 
Uh, enjoy special perks and points you can redeem for cash, travel, gift cards, and more. Cheryl and I headed to Japan to visit my daughter, hopefully at the end of October, assuming that Japan opens up to visitors and we're doing it using our points. But that's because we pay off our card in full. And if you don't, by the way, Navy Federal has a whole suite of tools to help you get your financial act together. So once you've got a clean house with the Navy Federal More Rewards American Express card, you can earn bonus points. Learn more about how you can get 25,000 bonus points at $250 value when you open a Navy Federal More Rewards American Express card today. Visit NavyFederal.org for more details and to apply. Insured by NCUA, American Express is a registered service mark of American Express used by Navy Federal under license. I think our takeaways, number one, you got to always watch out for the scam, OG. I think that uh, Bernie Madoff is dead, but scams are not. They're still out there. And then number two is you have an idea like Coinbase. You think that it might be something. If you've got smart people around you and you're working hard on what you see as an opportunity, don't let some anonymous person tell you bad idea and give up the dream. And then I think the third takeaway, file your taxes, right? If you still got your 2017 taxes hanging out there, I think it might be time to, uh, to get those filed and you might have $860 waiting for you. Our guest today has written for many leading publications in the U.S. and Europe, including, uh, man, The New Yorker, Time, Fortune, Forbes, Barron's, Fast Company, Money Worth, Bloomberg Markets. Who hasn't he written for? He's written for everybody. He was born and raised in London, but his curiosity has led him to smart people. And what do they do differently to make money? We'll talk about what fueled his desire to find out more about the wealthiest among us and the best traders out there. And we'll also hopefully uncover some of the secrets that the wealthiest among us have to not only be richer, but also to be happier. Let's say hello to William Green coming down to the basement. And coming down the stairs to the basement, it's our new friend, William Green. How are you, man? I'm great. I'm delighted to be here with you, Jeff. I'm so happy that you're here. How did you first get interested in money? Have you been interested in money your entire life? It was a very unlikely obsession for me because I I started off, I really wanted to be a famous novelist. And I I had these kind of high-minded dreams of literary fame. And I went to Oxford and studied English literature. And then I came out and moved to New York. And I would get I would get the New York Times would arrive on my doorstep. And I would literally throw away the business section because I just thought, the idea of a life devoted to business and money seems so crass and vulgar, you know, because I was like this young, intellectual, dreamy snob. And then when I was in, I guess, my early to mid 20s, my brother and I owned a small apartment in London that we sold. And so I suddenly had this small windfall. It wasn't any huge amount of money, but I I had to decide, what am I going to do with the money? And so I started to read pretty obsessively about funds and stocks. It just was riveting to me. And I just thought, this I, I was a slightly lazy kid, and I never had any intention of getting my hands dirty. And I thought, wait, there, there's this whole way that you can actually just think better. And if you think better, you can achieve financial independence. And I just thought this was the greatest thing ever. And so it just appealed to the sheer indolence of my character. But I had this amazing advantage, which was that because I was a young journalist and I got to write for things like Forbes and Fortune and Money and Time and Barons and stuff like that, I could actually go interview the greatest investors. And so I was able to kind of indulge my my obsession in a way that almost nobody else can. And so I would go off, say, to the Palmas to spend a day with Sir John Templeton, who was probably the greatest global stock picker of the 20th century, and would get to ask him about what he'd figured out at the time he was just about to turn 86. And I'm able to ask him, what are the secrets of investing? And then I could go interview Jack Bogle, who was the founder of the Vanguard Group and the, the pioneer of index funds, who... Uh, you know, the Vanguard Group now manages $6.2 trillion. And I'd be able to interview him about what he'd learned from his mentor and master and his hero in the financial business. And what were the principles that had 
stood the test of time for him. So for me, that was really the launch of this obsession. And then gradually, I guess, as I started to interview more and more of these people, I realized, well, they're not just extraordinary money makers, they're actually extraordinary thinkers. And so my interest in investing kind of deepened over the years, and it became really what, what gave rise to the obsession of this book that I've just written. I, I became obsessed with this idea that they had somehow cracked the code, not only of how to invest well, but actually how to think well. And that that oddly turns out to be incredibly helpful, not just in financial markets, but in every area of our lives. If we can, if we can learn from them how to be more rational, how to be less self-destructive, how, how to stack the odds subtly, subtly in our favor, but in every area of life. There are so many things that you said that I want to unpack, but the first one was the last sentence that you said, which was about odds. I understand that you also had a little detour before you got interested in stocks. You were going to make money even quicker than that. You went into horse racing. Yeah, when I was about 15, I went to the, uh, you can probably tell from my ridiculous accent, I went to the poshest English boarding school, which is called Eton, which is where people like Boris Johnson and David Cameron, and the last two Brit two out of the last three British prime ministers, and Prince William and Prince Harry went. And so on these sort of hot summer afternoons, you were supposed to be doing things like rowing on, on the River Thames or playing cricket. And I would <laughs> sneak out. And I would go with this friend of mine. I don't write about this, actually, but this friend of mine ended up in prison. Oh. And the two of us, the two of us would sneak off to Windsor near, near Windsor Castle, where the, the Queen has a home. And we would go to what euphemistically is known in England as a turf accountant, which basically just means you're making bets on horses. That was the start of this idea that there were ways in which you could think well and and make money without getting your hands dirty. And initially I did really well and I thought, wow, I really know what I'm doing. And I, I ruined my 16th birthday because my, my parents, such morons, so close-minded, refused to pay for this really expensive horse subscription. I can't to, figure out why. I, I, I remember why still sitting sitting in the car with this fury that they were so unreasonable. I couldn't understand why they would block this path to, to vast untold riches. And so, so I, just, I just totally, I sat there just stewing for the afternoon. Then I discovered that actually I didn't have any great talent for horse racing and for betting. And what I came to realize is that with all of these games, whether it's, whether it's horse racing, going to the casino, betting on stocks, you need to have an edge. And, and I end up writing about this guy, very extraordinary guy, who I regard as really the greatest game player in the history of investing, who's a guy called Ed Thorpe, who's now probably about 87. And he's the guy who figured out actually how to beat the casino at blackjack, and then figured out how to beat the casino at roulette by creating with a guy called Claude Shannon, who's a famous MIT scientist. They, they actually made the first wearable computer and he would activate it inside his shoe with, with the big toe inside his shoe so he could m measure the velocity of the roulette wheel and the ball so he could actually predict with a little better consistency than than chance where which of the 38 holes that the ball might land in and so what he said to me is he's just not interested in playing any game where he doesn't have an edge and this is one of the most obvious but important secrets of many of the great investors is that they don't play games where they don't have an edge. And if you extend that to our own situation, what that means is, for example, um, and I, I said to him, how can I tell if I had an edge? And he said, uh, well, if you don't have a rational reason to believe that you have an edge, then I'm afraid you probably don't. And so that admission that I don't have an edge, that there's nothing in particular, you know, I don't have particular financial skills. I'm not a great mathematician. I'm, I, I'm not particularly patient in terms of analyzing balance sheets, things like that. That means I have to accept my limitations and say, well, I'm probably not going to end up making money as a day trader. I'm not going to end up making money speculating on pork bellies. But if I make a few intelligent investments in the market, in good companies, good funds, good index funds, and then have tremendous patience and keep my costs low, keep my expenses low, keep my taxes low, that's actually playing a game in which you are putting the odds in your favor. So for example, what Ed thought this great gambler, speculator, and hedge fund manager, and, and casino beta said to me is, if you invest in, say, the S&P 500, you're playing this game very intelligently, and you'll beat about 80% of all investors. Because he said, basically, you're riding 
the fact that the market in the long run is going to go up because productivity increases, the population grows, companies become more efficient, um, the economy gradually grows and, and the market rises as those earnings grow. And he said, you're doing it at a very low cost. So let's say you're buying a Vanguard fund and you're spending 0.14% a year or something like that in expenses. That's a very intelligent piece of stacking the odds in your favor. So that sounds in some ways like an admission of defeat to say, well, I'm too stupid and too lazy and too limited actually to play this game that someone like Ed Thorpe's playing. But in fact, out of that admission of defeat comes great strength because, because you're able to stick with games that you can win. And that's just one way of winning this game. And, and I, I try to explore multiple ways of winning the game. But I think it's lovely to know that there's actually a default option within investing, where as, which is indexing, buying just very low cost index funds and holding them. And Jack Bogle, the founder of the Vanguard firm said to me, it's just obvious mathematically that index funds as a whole are going to win because, as he put it, you don't have a croupier, a middleman, just scraping off all of the fees and eroding your returns. And he explained the math to me. I think he said, if you say invest a million dollars and you make 10% a year for 30 years, it becomes $17.5 million, which is fabulous, right? Let's say 1.5% of that 10% annual return goes in expenses and fees, which is not even a huge amount, that actually diminishes your return to, I think, $11.5 million, which still sounds great, but you've actually made $6 million less just by spending one and a half percentage points a year in expenses by giving that money to the croupier. There are ways in which just by thinking intelligently about these games, just by knowing the basic rules, you're stacking the odds very heavily in your favor. So simply that knowledge of the impact of one and a half percentage points a year in expenses and how that compounds over 30 years. It sounds so banal, it sounds so trivial, but if it's ending up as a $6 million difference in the money in your pocket, it's just colossal. And I, and I think in a way, this is what I was kind of dreaming about when I first started gambling and horse racing and the stock market is that just by being a little bit more intelligent, just by thinking a little bit better and by controlling your emotions and your behavior, you actually are able to stack the odds massively in your own favor. When you met with Jack Bogle, I've heard from others that met with him before he passed away, uh, that he was a pretty intimidating figure. I've heard stories from three or four people. They're very intimidated when they met him. And I don't know if that's just he's a larger than life figure or if that's the way that he spoke. Tell me a little bit about him as a man and your meeting with him. Well, it's interesting. Warren Buffett, who, as we all know, is probably the greatest investor in history, says that if there were a statue erected for one person in the investment business, it would be Jack Bogle. That he said he's a hero to me and he should be a hero to you because he saved so much money and for so many people and helped so many people. But he was he was tough minded. And I mean, you can imagine to be the first person to bring in index funds. And he was he was attacked by everyone for sure. what seemed like a, an admission of mediocrity, a, a technique, that, a strategy that was so mediocre that you were just admitting the fact that you couldn't beat the market. It seemed kind of pathetic and defeatist. But this is one of the few people in the book that I interviewed over the phone. And this is about 20 years ago. And what was incredibly memorable to me, I, I, I looked at my notes a couple of years ago and went through the transcript really carefully. And there's a point where the phone goes dead as we're talking about his mentor, this guy, Walter Morgan, who had, who had started him in the investment business and was this great pioneer of mutual funds. And there's a point where I'm saying, Mr. Bogle, are, are you there? I, have I lost you? He says, I'm sorry, it's putting tears in my eyes, which is a wonderfully old fashioned way to put it. And I said, how come? And he said, well, as I talk about Mr. Morgan, I realize how much I loved him and how much I owe him. When he started to explain why it was that this mentor of his had such a huge impact on him, it was because Morgan, or Mr. Morgan, as he still talked about him after all these decades, was such an honorable human being who, who he said, treated the shareholder as king, treated the investor in his funds as king. And he said, my God, one of his clients wrote to him and said, Mr. Morgan, I need a suit and I can't afford a suit. And he said, and Mr. Morgan sent him one of his suits. 
So here's this story from Jack Bogle, who I think died in 2019, remembering his mentor from decades ago and remembering how honorable his mentor was and how, how he treated shareholders. And I think it's not only very touching to me, the fact that that kind of memory lives on, that, that the way people behaved actually lives on in, in their, their mentees, in, in their kids or their grandkids or the people they were boss to or whoever. But it's, it's that you actually see that mindset running through a company like Vanguard, because you can see that it's set up not to screw the, the customer. One of the investors in my book talks about setting up a fund that tried to get away from the sin and folly of Wall Street. And there's so much sin and folly on Wall Street where people are trying to take advantage of you or they're trying to sell you some really mediocre product that's going to serve them instead of you. And I think when you when you find these businesses, the, these companies, where they truly have an ethos of putting your your interests at least on a par with their own interests and hopefully higher than their interests. It's such a rare and special thing. And I, I found it quite moving that I could see where Bogle's sense of honor and decency had been shaped by this remarkable man who nobody remembers now. Have Have you found that rare in your interviews that these people are happier because I've, I don't know, I think most of us, well, I don't know about most people. I'll just put it according to me. Yeah. <laughs> I get this feeling about uh, like Gordon Gecko, you know, that Wall Street is Gordon Gecko more, faster, but, but very not happy, right? Not at all. This character is not a happy person. And I kind of, like you kind of just did, I throw that that shadow over Wall Street myself. But did you find that people that you interviewed, that somebody being happier was the exception? Or was that more the rule when people were very successful? It's a very interesting and, and nuanced question. I've tended to focus very heavily on writing about great investors who are not only extraordinary money makers, but are actually in some way honorable and exemplary people. So and it doesn't were, mean that you were, you were screening for that ahead of time. Yeah. There are several multi, multi billionaires that I interviewed who I ended up not writing about or only mentioning in a sentence or two. Cause I just thought I, it was almost like the, um, the body rejecting this organ that it didn't want in it. I, I, I would start writing about them. And I just think, I don't really admire this person. You know, yeah, they're really amazing at getting information. They're really amazing at, at making billions for themselves. But this is not a person I regard as an exemplary human being. And so I was consciously focusing on people who I regard as an embodiment of what I would call enlightened capitalism. So yeah, they're masters at making money. But I think they understand that if the money is just for them, that if they worship the money, then in some way, it's just a short circuit. It just messes with their lives. And so, I mean, I end the book with this extraordinary guy, Arnold Vanderbilt, who literally called me five minutes before we got talking here. And, and Arnold was literally calling to see how he could help me with something. And here's Arnold, who just is the embodiment. I mean, I literally, I write about him as the embodiment of a successful human being. I regard him as the most successful person in the investment world that I've ever met. And it's because he spends his whole time trying to help people. He said to me that the greatest thing that the money has given him is the ability to help other people. And here's a guy who literally grew up on the same street as Anne Frank, in hiding in Amsterdam, and his parents were in Auschwitz, and he was in a in an orphanage throughout the Holocaust, being hidden. And yet, he's somehow managed to turn his life into this extraordinarily successful, uh, to me, the embodiment of what a successful and truly abundant life is. And I think at the heart of that is the fact that he figured out very early on that if it was just about his ego, just about his wealth and his bank balance, then his life was going to be pretty stunted. And so he's a wonderful role model to me. And it's it's funny to me that literally just now just he now. called to see if he could help. Well, it, something that was powerful to me was at the beginning of the book, in chapter one, you really make the case that, you know, you talk about competitive advantage, that you don't have to make up this competitive advantage. Uh, speaking with uh, Jack Schwager, I know a, a guy I'm sure that you know, Jack talks about all of these uh, wizards, right, that have yeah. new ways of looking at the market or they're evolving. And when I read Jack's books, I always think I got to come up with the new, new thing, or I got to find this advantage. Y you begin the book with Monish 
Pabrai, I believe. Is that how you say Beautifully it? Beautifully pronounced, Joe. <laughs> Impeccable. But Monish is quite a character. But the thing that was powerful to me was that Monish realized that he didn't need to reinvent the wheel. The wheel had been invented by studying it, much like you're saying here, William, much by studying the wheel, he too could do great things, which he subsequently did. Yeah, it's a very profound idea. And just to give you a little background, basically in 1994, Monish is killing time in Heathrow Airport. And he starts reading a book by Peter Lynch that mentions Buffett. And it mentions Buffett's returns over something like 45 years, which was, he'd basically done so extraordinarily that he he doubled his money 18 times and was well on his way to becoming the richest man in the world. And what Monish figured out is, well, this guy's mastered the game of compounding money over the long term. So let me reverse engineer what Buffett has figured out, since Buffett is the greatest player of this particular game. And then to use Monish's words, let me clone what he does. Let me replicate, model, mimic what he does. And so this becomes the basis of the first chapter of my book is basically saying we're also obsessed with trying to be original and trying to reinvent the wheel. And in fact, there's this smarter strategy in many cases, which is to to figure out who who is wiser and smarter than us? And what have they figured out that we actually need to reverse engineer and then and then mimic in a way that's true to who we are and true to our talents? I mean, there's no there's no point me trying to speculate on pork bellies if, uh, you know, if I have no no mathematical skills and no temperamental advantage. So it has to be true to who you are. But the actual tactic of reverse engineering what the best players have figured out is is enormously powerful. And what, what Monish figured out is that basically Buffett's entire strategy was based on three laws of investing that he derived from his teacher, Ben Graham. And the most important of them is simply that you want to buy things at a discount to their value. And Joel Greenblatt, who's another of the investment giants in the book, who, who basically made 40% a year for 20 years, which means that you turn a million dollars into $836 million, said to me the exact same thing. He said, the whole essence of investing, when you reduce it to its absolute essence, to its purest essence, is value an asset and then buy it for less than it's worth. And so you see this going through all of the giants of investing that I write about, whether it's Howard Marks, who manages, you know, $120 billion in alternative investments, who's a, a pioneer in bonds and the like, or Joe Greenblatt, this swaggering hedge fund giant who making 40% a year for 20 years, or Buffett or his partner, genius partner, Charlie Munger, who I interview for the book. They're all valuing businesses and buying them for less than they're worth. And so for people like us, this raises incredibly profound and obvious questions like, do you know how to value a business? So what Joe Greenblatt said is, for most people, they simply have no business picking individual stocks because they don't know how to value a business. And so I think one of the most basic things, if you want to become a really successful investor, is to learn these these financial laws that someone like Monish Pabrai says are really like the laws of physics. Because he said, most of the people he's playing this game against simply don't know the rules, which is fantastic if you're someone like Monish. I mean, it's an enormous advantage that the rest of us dopes don't know the rules. But I would like to make the playing field a little more equal by sharing what people like Buffett and Munger and Monish have figured out and saying, no, no, look, these there are these simple rules that you don't want to violate. And the joke is, that this is one area in which the greatest investors actually have been unbelievably generous in explaining what works. I mean, Greenblatt, Buffett, Howard Marks, Munger, they explain ad nauseam what the laws are. And Monish was just flabbergasted when he started investing that most people just ignore them. And he said his language is always full of expletives, so I won't quote him directly, but (laughs) he said it's like studying physics and, and having a whole generation of physicists ignoring the law of gravity. And he said, whether you like it or not, gravity is going to pull you down, man. <laughs> Even uh, Bill uh, uh, Roan from the Sequoia Fund. Bill Ruan, yeah. His four rules that you have just right at the beginning of the book are powerful. I feel like all of these, I feel like these investors, the one thing that is kind of the through line for all of them is they all have this solid foundation they're working off of. At least you give me that feeling by your writing throughout the book. Would you say that that's that's true? Absolutely. Many of them have reduced everything to two, three, four laws 
or guidelines that are that, that prevent them from doing anything stupid. And uh, if you apply a handful of rules where you know I'm just not going to violate this rule and you adhere to it consistently, it's going to keep you out of a lot of trouble. I'd like to tell you one thing about ruin that isn't in the book, actually, that's extraordinary. If we have one moment, which yep. is the, the, well, it's great. And even before you do that, let's talk a little bit about who he is, because I know who he is. You know who he is, but our listeners might not. He ran, he's he's run a great fund called the Sequoia Fund, which has just been amazing, just incredible results. Yeah, and basically, Warren Buffett in the 1950s set up these limited partnerships, and in the late 60s, he decided the market is so overvalued. I'm going to close down my partnerships and return all the money. And he said to his shareholders. If you want to invest with someone else who's extraordinary, invest with my friend, Bill Ruane. And over the next few decades, Ruane just had the most spectacular performance. And, and he talked about you know, these four rules that I explained in the introduction to the book that, were, that he had learned from a master of his, who was a, an extraordinary guy called Albert Hettinger, who had gone bankrupt in, in 1929. And these were the rules that Hettinger had passed down to him. So I'm kind of trying to share these, these laws from a century back, really, the things that helped Hettinger and then helped Ruin. But someone told me an extraordinary story about Ruin, where there's a guy I wrote about called Paul Lounces, who's a very, very smart, very good self-made money manager, who it took him eight years to go through school, because, to go through college, because he came from this very poor Greek immigrant family. He worked every weekend. He, he worked cleaning hospitals. From the age of about seven or eight, he was working cleaning dishes in his, in his uncle's restaurant. And Paul Lancis said to me, his first real job in the investment world was actually working for Bill Ruane. And I was asking him about how he met Ruane and how he got to work with him. And Lancis said to me that when he went for his interview, his son, who was very, very young, I think maybe a year or less, had a heart defect and needed to have heart surgery. And he starts talking to Ruane about it. And Ruane said to him, um, how much does an operation like that cost? Paul Lancis said, I don't know, Mr. Ruin, I'm not sure. Ruin said to him, whatever it costs, I'll pay for it. And Paul Lancis said, but Mr. Ruin, you haven't even hired me yet. And Ruin said, don't worry, I will. And I thought that was such an extraordinary insight into Bill Ruin's character. And there was something deeply moving to me about the fact that this guy who died several years ago, yeah. that I'm able to kind of learn this extraordinary thing that he did that was a, a real reflection of what he was like as a human being. And it made me think, however rich you are, however successful you are, the things that you're remembered for actually are things like that. And that's that's what Paul Lancis was conveying to me all, all these years later. Don't worry, I'll hire you and whatever that costs, I'll pay for it. Uh, what, a, what a human being. And it makes you think, so what's my legacy going to be? It's not going to be how rich I am. It's not going to be what my returns are. It is it is the way you behave towards other people. And so throughout the book, even though I actually don't mention that particular story, what I'm trying to do is give a sense not only of how you make money, but actually of how you're supposed to live and what, what actually constitutes a really successful life. And so, yeah, this is a great game. And I, I was right when I was a kid and became obsessed with this idea that you could make money just by thinking well. But if it's just about the money, it's a pretty stunted life. So this is why the, the last the epilogue of the book is called Beyond Rich. And it's about what actually constitutes a truly abundant and prosperous life. And secretly, that's the most important part of the book. The, the other stuff will make you rich, but that's actually the most important part of the book. I think that's a great place for us to end a discussion that I could have for maybe six or seven hours, William. The book is called Richer, huh. Richer, Wiser, Happier, How the World's Greatest Investors Win in Markets in Life. It's available everywhere, William. Everywhere. And you should buy many copies. Buy it for everybody you know. They'll all become richer, wiser, and happier. So, so I encourage you to buy it en masse, in bulk. <laughs> Hey, stackers, uh, it, it, it's me, your totally cool and calm and collected pal, Joe's, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Uh, you know, I was just perusing the holiday calendar, and, and, and then I see it. it it's apparently uh, National Surprise Drug Test Day. I mean, that's a, that's a weird holiday, right? I mean, that can't be a real thing. They wouldn't do that. I mean, I'm not worried or anything, but I mean, they sprung that on us at the last minute. I, I think I... 
Uh, it must have been on purpose, right? I mean, because they say it's a surprise. And I've been, look, I've been the star host of this podcast for over like a thousand episodes. And never once have they sprung a drug test on me. But it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be a surprise if you knew it was coming, right? So well, let's just, you know, we'll just be cool as a cucumber and get to today's trivia. So our question is, what percentage of workers fail workplace drug tests? I'll be back faster than you. Test will come back totally clean. It's going to, I mean, total, I'm pretty sure it's going to come back totally clean. As you know, small businesses are still recovering from 2020 and looking for resources to rise to the challenge. And that's why Dell Technologies assembled an all-star lineup of podcasters to create a virtual conference to share advice and inspiration for small businesses. Whether you're still working remotely or back together again, let Dell Technologies help safeguard your business with modern devices and Windows 10 Pro. Search Dell Technologies Small Business Podference on Radio.com, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts starting May 10th. Stackers, you want to hear something amazing? Discover matches all the cash back you earn on your credit card at the end of your first year automagically with no limit on how much you can earn. How amazing is that? In fact, it's even more amazing because of all the places Discover's accepted. 99% of places in the U.S. that take credit cards. So when it comes to Discover, get used to hearing yes more often. Learn more at discover.com slash yes. 2021 Nielsen Report. Limitations apply. Hey, hey trivia fans. It's Joe's mom. She's giving me these weird looks. She hasn't sprung the drug test on me, but I'm pretty sure that shoe's going to drop any second. Uh, I know, so I'm probably a little bit worried, but here's the thing, Stackers. So the real story is I was planting some flowers for Joe's mom in the backyard yesterday, and I I tweaked my back. Happens to young folks like me all the time. I, I needed something to help take the edge off. That's all. That's all. It was totally innocent. Little did I know... We were just moments away from surprise drug test day. Uh, Maybe if we just keep this whole thing on the DL, no one's even going to notice. So let's just move on through this trivia thing like nothing's out of the ordinary. I mean, look, I got the pills from this totally cool looking dude at the uh, gas station, but they were in one of those prescription bombs. I mean, they're completely above. I'm sure I've got nothing to worry about. So let's just, we'll, we're going to get on to the trivia answer and I'll just move along like everything's totally fine. Okay, here, the question was, what percentage of workers fail workplace drug tests? Quest Diagnostics said that work drug positivity rates hit 4.5% in 2019, the highest since 2003. The company says the coronavirus pandemic, like we can blame everything on that, which shows no signs of stopping anytime soon, likely accelerated some substance abuse. So there you have it. There you have it. It's it's all perfectly understandable. Uh, time for me to get out of here, though, and uh, just be calm and cool and chill. See you. Big thanks to William Green for stopping by. You know, I love this idea, OG, that if you put in the hard work, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Like everybody thinks you need the new, new, new thing. But uh, to William's point, study people that are good at what you want to do and go do it. Like this doesn't just apply to stocks, right? If you want to make animated movies, go watch what Pixar does study their techniques. If you want to build desks, look at the people that are building desks and what do they do? I think we get a lot better when we iterate off of already successful people ideas. Like I was just going to use the chocolate cake example, but my wife hates it. She's found a recipe that the entire family loves. Everyone who has that chocolate cake is like, oh my God, this is perfect. And she's like, I want to try something new. It's like, no, this is this is the thing now. Do not this deviate. This is what we do. Because you've reached the point at which it's really good. You know, so there's a risk there, obviously, with going, well, but maybe we'll put peanut butter in it. You know, maybe it'll taste great with peanut butter. We'll never know if we don't try. But we also know that we've, the worst that happens is we've got this really good cake. Obviously, when it comes to investing, and you think about like all the possible different ways to to get to your goal, some of the things are always going to be true. Do it early and often. Yeah. That's one of the bigger ones. And 
don't ever stop and don't let your emotions drive your investment decisions. And like all those, all those things you go, yeah, 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 yeah. But that's not what normal people do. They do the opposite of those things. Speaking of normal or not normal, we read all kinds of statistics about how wealthy people give less money, are more selfish, do things that aren't as nice for other people. It's great to have William Green on the other side of that, looking at many of these people that do just amazing things with their money. Oh, gee. And it's, it, it, I don't know. Uh, I love, and we've talked about this on a bunch of shows lately. It seems to be the theme, I think, in 2021 for you and I, talking about living a life that's bigger than just you, right? This feels like a theme that we've been iterating on for a long time. Maybe it's on my mind a lot lately, or maybe it's on your mind, or maybe it's just the zeitgeist as we're trying to, the nations in the world is coming out of this pandemic. Maybe that's it. But this idea of having wealth and using it to make the world around you a better place is also pretty, pretty flipping cool. All right, before I proselytize too much, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline. We'll tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first, OG. We are rounding the corner into a, quite a birthday time for us here in the OG family. Lots of birthdays coming up. Birthdays. So uh, since we were talking about cake, uh, I'm a mm. big fan of chocolate cake. So not frosting. Frosting is disgusting. Sounds like chocolate Sh- cake. Cheryl and I got to make a trip to back to your house. Frosting's awesome with some milk. Mm. Yeah, it's the nastiest thing. But cake is good. So good. Slather that uh, frosting all over it. You'd roll yourself in frosting, wouldn't you? Who says I haven't? Exactly. That's called Friday at our house. <laughs> Freaky Friday. <laughs> I think so. I think some people just threw up listening to that. It's actually the two things you value, according to Haven Life here, is your loved ones and your time. But what's more fun than uh, rolling yourself up in, in uh, frosting and taking your time with that? That's why they made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now to get a free quote. Their application is simple. It's online. You get an instant coverage decision. Prices are affordable. And of course, they have a more than 160-year-old insurer behind them in Mass Mutual. And today, we're going to throw out the Haven Lifeline to our new friend, James. Say hi, James. What's up, Joe and OG? Got a quick career question for you. I'm looking to get into becoming a financial planner, but the problem is that I spent quite a bit of money on student loans to get degrees in, um, let's just call them unrelated fields. So going back to school to get a finance degree or anything like that isn't really an option. What would be your advice for somebody looking to break into the industry who does not necessarily have any education or experience in doing it? Now, let Gertrude know for me that I don't need a t-shirt. My wife says I have plenty of those. So instead, I was thinking maybe some custom sneakers, you know, maybe some downward facing red arrows, just as an homage to the month I spent day trading on Robin Hood last year. Anyway, <laughs> love the podcast. Enjoy learning nothing all the time. Thanks, guys. I love the dude calling his James Cullen. Hey, here's the swag I want. Yeah, just 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 get me get me some of that swag. Really, as much as we talk about it, we we probably should have a uh, probably should have a Robin Hood uh, t shirt. Yeah, I don't I don't know what the what the rules are on that. Our Robin Hood t shirt might not be the one that they're looking to have made. Hey, let's tackle this. So, not gonna go the traditional route and take some classes to get into financial planning, but I don't think you or I took the traditional route to get into financial planning. So, tell me what uh, what you're thinking for James. Well, firstly, I would suspect that the vast majority of people who work in finance, in personal finance, came from a career other than, or came from a background other than personal finance to begin with. So, I mean, anybody that's older than 40 probably didn't even have financial planning degrees 20 years ago. That wasn't a thing. Now, of course, you can get a degree in financial planning at some schools, but um, it wasn't very prevalent. So I think having some experience outside of the world of Personal finance also can help quite a bit, frankly. 
because a lot of the stuff that's associated with being a great advisor has nothing to do with with money. It's being able to have great listening skills and communication and empathy and like all these other sorts of things that you don't really get in the just because you can do a finance calculation. <laughs> you know that's not part of the part of the background. I mean, over the years as we've talked about this, we keep coming back to the same thing, which is that. A lot of people think that uh, personal finance is really, really quite simple. You know, you just sit at a desk, you talk to some people about their money, they do what you tell them, and uh, life goes on. And and some of that is true. The problem is the kind of beginning part of that, which is having the people sit across the desk from you or on the phone or Zoom or whatever. So I think that um, a lot of financial planning, especially early on, is just how great you are at getting in front of people. You know, how great you are at marketing, how great you are at uh, sales, because, you know, you're selling yourself and, and the solutions that you're going to provide. You're selling them on their goals and their ability to reach them and and using their resources to, to reach the goals that they want to do. Sometimes you're helping solve a problem that, that they didn't know exists, and you have to bring that to someone's attention and, and say, hey, this is a bigger thing than you think it is. Uh, and that's some form of sales and I'm using air quotes. So I think that a lot of financial planning, especially early on is, is your ability to be in front of lots of people and not stop doing that. How Joe and I started was here's a phone book and uh, there's a phone Jack and here's a phone. So <laughs> why don't you see if those three things can go together and figure out what to do next? You, know, you can't that was, market that way anymore though. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. They, uh, I mean, you could, I suppose, but it would take, it'd be a while. Actually, I wonder about that. You know, you say you can't do it anymore. Like, there's seriously been like solid 15 years of not very much telemarketing. Do you think like if you got back into it, like you could just make a killing because no one else is doing that? <laughs> yeah, but the way the rules are, man, you got to be very careful about how you do it. Like, yeah, that was standing the rule part. Yeah, there's got to be some warmth there, which is why people went to, you know, you see these uh, cold calling now goes to like, uh, well, you remember this, you'd call them fish bowls. Right where people put their their card in to hi Joe, you and I share a lot of connections on LinkedIn, and I was wondering. Yes, right. <laughs> Deleted the cold LinkedIn. By the way, has to go. That's so funny. Oh, it's horrible. The cold LinkedIn. Whoever I need, I need to do a better job of social media because I don't. I'm never on it because it's so overwhelming. It's all stuff like that. You know, it's all chaos. But anyways, back to uh, point at hand here. So. One way, if you're starting your firm, is you know you got to figure out who you're gonna who you're going to go after and and figure out a way to do that. What's also evolving now over the last ten or fifteen years has been kind of like associate roles, and um, you know, so a firm that has already an established presence or an established niche that they go after, let's say, need support, so you can work as an associate in those firms. And most of the time they're going to be requiring a, a CFP or at least getting pretty close to it. So it kind of depends on your personality. You know, like if you think like, Hey, I can, I want to run my own thing. You know, you can start at like, start looking at uh, XY planning network is a great place for, for new advisors getting started. If you need the sales training and the straight up, like, I don't even know what to say to anybody about anything. You know, those big organizations like Merrill and Ameriprise and those places are going to provide excellent sales and marketing training. Yeah. And I think while a lot of people will tell you that might not be the ideal place to work, I think it's a great place to be from. Like when I was at the Citadel, there were these, you know, people sold these quote illegal t-shirts. You weren't, they weren't sanctioned by the Citadel, but they were all these Citadel t-shirts and upperclassmen would, would sell these to freshmen to you know, fund whatever they were, they were trying to do. But I remember there was a t-shirt somebody made that said the Citadel, a great place to be from, but a horrible place to be. And I think that you can kind of turn that around with some of these large sales organizations. Certainly I know people that love working at these, yeah. at these places. Yeah, I got and, a friend of mine that works at Merrill loves it. Yeah. Not that, but you and I both hear people say, well, I don't really want to do that. I'll tell you that sales training OG is invaluable because you can't be great at anything until you have a client sitting across from you. And the thing that you learn 
is that to some degree, learning to be a rainmaker, as they call it, somebody that is attractive to other people come and do business with you is a skill, not just for financial planners, but for everybody. It's a life skill. And learning to attract customers to your business, I think is huge and and will pay you huge dividends. Like it it was funny, but I had a mentor when I was at Ameriprise he said there was a guy in his office when he started as a financial planner that they would all go ask for help. Whenever they had a serious financial planning problem, they would go ask this guy for help. And he would, he would solve all the big time technical questions that they had. And one day he went to the office copy machine and the admin had accidentally left the list of everybody's paychecks on there. It was just how much money everybody had made year to date at that point. And it was close to the end of the year. And he looked at it and he realized that smart guy down the hall that he was asking all the questions of was making one third of the money that he was making because he was focused on activity and seeing lots of people. And the smart guy never saw any clients, but knew every single rule. And that's when he realized that, and this isn't financial planning, by the way. And I know some people might be disgusted by this story going, oh, it's all just sales. Life is sales. Everything is sales. You can make the best flipping chocolate cake to go back to our earlier story. But if nobody buys the chocolate cake, it doesn't matter. Right. That's when he realized that activity pays And learning how to be attractive pays and then surrounding yourself with smart people so that your client gets great help is also important. But that person's not getting paid nearly what the Rainmaker's getting paid. Right. Yeah. So I think you have to decide on the path. You know, are you trying to build your own firm? Are you just trying to get in at a firm? You know, because that's an opportunity as well now and kind of go from there. But it will require, I should say, some schooling. You know, there's a big push these days for credentialed professionals. And if you've got a degree in engineering, that's fantastic. Good for you. But you're going to need to get a CFP eventually. And that's going to require some education costs and and so on and so forth. So I don't think that you can get out of it with zero, but you can get started with nothing and and in the the near future kind of work on that. Yeah. I think that the moat to becoming a successful financial planner is longer than most people think. It is a wider moat. It is a difficult swim. But once you reach that other shore, it is so worth it. Yeah, number one determinant in uh, advisor income, according to uh, Michael Kitsis, who who just did a research report on this, was longevity. <laughs> yeah, just stay around, make enough money to to stay around. But the reason why it's successful and why it's such a fulfilling career is you get to watch so many people retire, put their kids through college, You get to help people achieve goals. And so you see that even just lifetime satisfaction from people in financial planning is very high. I think for those reasons, because you're always, you're always in these pretty exciting discussions. Always something going on. I, I sometimes felt like I'd have a meeting with clients. You could tell they didn't really talk about money that much. And you facilitate this phenomenal conversation. I just had the feeling that some people were going home and, getting busy after our meeting. Oh like there was some love. There was some love during those, during You're, the, you weren't, you weren't that good too. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're financial planning conversations. Trust me. They weren't that, that, that amazing. <laughs> they weren't that, you don't think that, that feud a little no. Barry White later. No, no, I don't, I don't okay, know. So I got my Roth funded baby. <laughs> Talk to me. I think that's more erotic than I didn't get my Roth funded. Does that make you feel great that at home, husband's like, hey, so that stuff that Joe said, it's pretty awesome, right? Remember that standard deviation conversation? (sighs) My asset allocation. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. so much precious metals in it. This has been the weirdest show ever. Just the weirdest show. Uh, We got lots of people to thank. We're going to let Doug thank all those people. First of all, let's thank James for that call. Uh, James, sadly, can't send you those sneakers, but good luck finding them. I think it's a great idea. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. If you, like James, have a question for us, and uh, James, good luck with the career. And as you uh, are on the path, let us know how it's going. Love to hear from somebody who's uh, just starting to walk down the financial planner path. I think we're all pretty interested in 
how that looks. But as I mentioned, there are a few people to thank besides James. Number one, big thanks to everyone who referred our show to a friend or a colleague. Helping other people take that financial independence ride with you is always pretty exciting and it's more fun with friends. So thanks to everybody who told friends about the Stacky Benjamin Show. Thanks to everybody who's left us a review of this podcast. By the way, mom has this review on the refrigerator. Five stars from Crypto, Crypto, Crypto. I don't know if we've read this one. We we may have already already read it, but she's hey, she's still got it on the fridge. This is from Brainwash One Oh One. If you're interested in crypto, it's just one of the innumerable topics about which you'll learn absolutely nothing by listening. Five stars. That's from Brainwash One. Brainwash One then goes on to tell us that uh, they want an extra. They they want a T-shirt for leaving us a review. No, but you're helping other stackers learn what the Stacking Benjamin Show is about. So thank you, Brainwash. Third, if you'd like a guide to a show like today's show to see what's coming up ahead of time, head to the stacker. Our email, not only will you get that, you'll also get our events, which uh, happen a few times a year called The Stack. We have live events happening. We also consistently have places where OG and I are hanging out on the internet and uh, either giving live presentations or talking with other creators about money. All that is in the stacker, stackybenjamins.com forward slash stacker. You also get my money tips based on all the things that I messed up. Last in certainly not least, if you're somebody that just goes, you know what? I'm here because I need better financial planning in my life than I've had in the past while OG and his team are taking clients. So head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash OG. That's stackingbenjamins.com forward slash OG. That is OG's team's calendar and use that to interface with them on how to make better financial decisions in the future. All right, that's going to do it for today. Doug, you got it from here, man. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our headline. You're not able to control your taxes, but you do have more control over the impact your dollar makes in the world. Second, take a lesson from William Green. Do you want to be successful with money and life? If so, set goals, make a plan to make it happen, and then stick to your plan and don't let current conditions change your plan. But the big lesson? All that worry about a random drug test? It turns out those little orange pills I took were just ibuprofen and those aren't going to show up on a drug test. Uh, I'm clean, folks. Totally clean. Uh, Yeah, I I knew it. I, I, I just, I knew it. To learn more about our guests and for more resources, you can head to our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Do you want to learn more about how to be a better investor from some of the best and brightest investors throughout history? If so, check out William Green's new book, Richer, Wiser, Happier, How the World's Greatest Investors Win in Markets and Life, available wherever books are sold. This show is created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Taylor Stevens, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at S Benjamin's Cast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and it appears I've fallen and I can't get up. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor.
Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. During the after show, we rarely talk about money and it generally isn't as serious as it was on Monday when we discovered that uh, there was a Robin Hood ad in our show. So we had to have a frank discussion with our stacker friends about what happened there. Today, I want to go back to what we talk about a lot, which is TV shows. And OG, I've been watching two TV shows I wanted to talk about a little bit. Number one is I finished, finally finished the last season of The Crown. Ah, yes. Did, did you watch season four? Uh, I feel like there's five, but I did see the last, yeah. Yeah, it ends with the, uh, kind of ends with Diane, Princess Diana. Yeah, Princess Diana. I will, I'll say this after watching it. Prince Charles is a d- <laughs> <laughs> If If that's how he really is, yeah. If that is how he really is, just <clears throat> what a self, boy, but in the Queen... The queen in one of the last episodes really, really gave him an earful, didn't she? About his immaturity. Yeah, you kind of wonder about it, you know, because obviously that was, I guess, taking place in the 70s, early 80s, I guess, right? Mid, mid 80s now, I suppose. Mid, was mid, the... to, mid to late 80s. Yeah. Yeah, because I guess the kids were, were getting a little bit older in the final season, right? So, yeah. He does. He does come off as this kind of a jack wagon, huh? Yeah, Diana died in uh, 1997, so it was even 1990s. This is early 1990s. He does seem like a like a jackass. He certainly does. Like every time he said something in those later episodes, I'm like, wow, wow, just uh, just pretty wild. Uh, and I'm reading here that Kristen Stewart is going to play Princess Diana on a new uh, biopic because you know what's wild is that I didn't think that I would enjoy The Crown at all, that show. I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. I don't think so. And I kind of got sucked into, I think you were the same, weren't you? Where you kind of got sucked into watching an episode. And then once you start it, it's so well written. And you can see why it won so many awards over the four seasons. And I think it is four over the seasons that you just, you, you, you can't stop watching. It's good TV. I like the earlier ones better, the like historical stuff, you know, the more contemporary things I feel like we've kind of lived through. So I don't really care too much about that. But, uh, yeah. you know, some of the stuff like in the 40s and 50s was kind of was pretty interesting to me. That said, though, I think that, you know, when they change queens from the young queen to the older queen from Claire Foy to Olivia Coleman, Olivia Coleman's a great actress. Yeah. Just, just a fantastic, uh, and I liked her also in, uh, we did a review a few weeks ago of a Oscar nominated movie, the, the father, and she's so good. So good there. Another show that I'm watching though, that is equally good. I love, I, I don't like I'm on episode four and I'm loving, absolutely loving last chance you basketball. Yeah, Doug was telling me about this one. It is so good. The coach on this team is such a likable guy. And the players have such interesting stories. And some of them are battling some demons that you just, it feels in some ways like a scripted story. They did a really good job of showing this basketball team. And uh, much, much more likable than that last chance you coach from uh, the, the first two seasons of the football one. In fact, I think the most likable person in the in, in the football one was the uh, woman that helps them, their academic yeah. advisor. Right. Like, yep. like she's the likable person in the football one. So two good series to watch. You watching anything? Uh, no. I mean, with the, uh, no, I, there's with basketball, basketball was on and then uh, the Masters was on for a week and yeah, yeah nothing really top of mind. I, I kind of sort of paused on the flight attendant. Yeah. Is that HBO show? Yeah, I remember you reviewing that and just going, uh... Yeah, I just don't see where it goes. So. Uh, next week, the other thing I'm watching is uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Yeah, boys are loving that. Yeah, I want to get a little further into it. Obviously, it comes out every week, and we're watching it when it comes out, but um, I want to get maybe another week or two into it before uh, before I review it here. But like your boys... Uh, Cheryl and I, the minute it comes out, we're excited to watch it. All right, everybody, let's go stack some Benjamins. See ya.